Come on, go ahead and do that right now. Magnify the Lord with the clapping of your hands and the lifting of your voice. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. The book of Zechariah chapter 4 will be my text today that I will preach to you from. Happy spring, everybody. It is a great occasion, and just to clarify, after Brother Cody spoke, we do want you coming next week. He was good. I appreciate our youth pastor. Isn't he wonderful? Aren't we thankful? Amen. And so uh, it's going to be a great, great occasion. Next week, God has already given me a word that's rested in my spirit really since, since probably November or December. And uh, I'm excited to preach that. We're looking at a service that'll go from about 8.30 to 9.30 and uh, in our first service. And that will be a mirrored service. And God's going to move and touch lives. Make sure you bring somebody with you. Go out and invite somebody. Invite your neighbors. Uh, take some of those palm cards. Make sure you do that. And uh, spread the word. We will be starting a series on the following Wednesday called how to begin again and so uh, it will be our Wednesday night series and so this Wednesday concludes our life groups split sessions and we will go back after Easter into a general session here on Wednesdays on how to begin again dealing with emotional emotional wellness and emotional healing and so we we find it's a great need but we have found in this church so many people set free from fear um, grief, anxiety, jealousy, all these things that happen. And uh, we know that God can heal all of us. Can you say amen? amen? It's so good to be in church with you today. I enjoy those kids. That made me want to get up and wave my hands. Victory. Don't we love our children? Praise God. Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4 talks about Zerubbabel who was building a temple and uh, he sees some things he asks and we're not going to read the whole chapter but he's, he sees this, this, this candlestick and he says do you know what you see he said I don't know and the angel said in verse 5 that talked with me answered and said unto me knowest thou not what these be and I said no my lord he's talking about the, the, the golden candlestick and the bowl that was on it that was fed by golden pipes that that went down into this and and uh, he said no my lord then he answered and spake unto me saying this is the word of the lord look at your neighbor and say this is the word of the lord saying not by might would you say that with me not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the lord of hosts verse 8 moreover the word of the lord came unto me saying the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Somebody say, I'll finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Why? Because you're going to finish what has begun. What he began in you, what started in you, he's going to finish through you. Oh, let there be an amen. Verse 10, for who hath despised the day of small things? The New Living Translation says, don't despise small beginnings. Look at your neighbor said, don't despise small beginnings. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet. The plumb line. And the hand of Zerubbabel. That's what they use to measure, to get square measures, to find direct points. They didn't have what we have today, lasers and levels. They use plumb lines to get their 90 degree angles. This is what they build. And when you see this, he said, don't despise small beginnings. Zerubbabel was standing on the foundation that had been set. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. And you'll find that the anointing of the Lord was with him. I want you to look at your neighbor 
and say, we're going to finish. Somebody shout, I'm going to finish. I like to preach from this portion of Scripture simply, it is enough. It is enough. Clap your hands and shout another praise of victory to the Lord. Come on, it's all right to feel victorious. The Bible says, clap your hands, all you people, and shout with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you as you are seated. All he had with a thousand people opposing him. Samson didn't have much. When a thousand of the Philistines were going to destroy him, his own brethren had tied him up and turned him over to the enemy. It did not look like he could win by looking at him. He looks around trying to find something to use to conquer that which was against him. And he reached down and he pulled a jawbone from a skull of a donkey. And he began to use what was in his hand. It did not look like much. But you know the story. He killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. You know why? Because if you would just use what you have, you'll find that it is enough. You'll find a little boy by the name of David. He was the great psalmist, more than a powerful warrior. In reality, he was a powerful worshiper. He is opposed by a man that some believe was nine and a half feet tall. What we do know about him, he was a giant. What we do know, he was the champion of the Philistines. David runs toward the battle when others were running from his booming voice and his huge size. And the Goliath says to him, you come to me with a... Goliath looks at him and says, says to him that, am I a dog that you would send a kid out to fight? And David says, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a shield. But I come against you with a slingshot and a stone. Is that what he said? That's not what he said. He said, I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. What he was saying is, you're not going to be intimidated by the stone and the slingshot. That's just what I have. But what's with me is much greater than what you see with me. Fighting Goliath with a slingshot and a stone isn't really enough. But when you mix what you have with faith, what doesn't seem like will work becomes enough. I come to preach to you today, you just need to use what you have. You just need to give to the Lord what you've got. Quit waiting on the big break and give him what you have. When I was growing up in church, they sang a song that says you don't need a whole lot just to use what you got. Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. There's no one in this room today that can conquer that which is against you by your ability. That's why he says, Zerubbabel, it's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power. What he was saying was the victory that I'm going to give to allow you to finish isn't going to be by your ability. For it's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. Because Psalms 23 that we read at most gravesides really wasn't written for the dead. It was written for the living. And it goes something like this. The Lord is my. I shall not. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures and leadeth me beside the. Oh, he restoreth me. He, re, he, he restoreth me. He leadeth me through paths of righteousness for his. Yea, though I walk. Look at your neighbor and say through the valley. And not to the valley. He's not just bringing you to it. He's going to bring you. 
Come on, I want somebody to shout. If he brings you to it, he's taking you through it. And here's how I'm coming through it. It's for thou art with me. You can't see him, but he's with me. I'm not here by myself. There's somebody in the room that's battling cancer, but I come to tell you, you don't have the ability. What chemo can't do, just one mention of the name of Jesus can fix and heal and change because your faith is enough. Somebody shout, it is enough. He told a man, you may be seated, he told a man by the prophet named Elijah, he said, I want you to go to Zarephath. He said, when you get there, there's going to be a widow woman who is going to sustain you. Oh, he leaves. He, he leaves Cherith. The ravens were feeding him and the brook was flowing. It dried up. The ravens stopped coming. He has to leave. He goes to Zarephath and when he gets there, there's a widow woman appearingly would be feeble nearly, weak. She and her son, her husband's passed away. And the preacher walks up in a drought and says, would you get me a drink of water? And she said, yes, I will. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to do for me more than just a drink of water. I'd like you to make me a cake. Make me a cake. And she says, I don't have enough to make you a cake because I was getting ready to take the meal that I have and the little bit of flask of oil, just a little meal in the barrel. Everybody say a little meal. She said, I was going to take the little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. And she said, it was going to fix one more meal so my son and I could eat and die. She said, I don't have enough, preacher, to get you a cake. You know what he said? It is enough. Just make me a cake first. And God's going to take care of your needs. You know why he could say that? Because God had spoken to him it was going to be all right. And that it was her that was going to sustain him. She said, okay. She took a little meal. A little meal. Wasn't enough. She took a, a, a little bit of oil. Mixed it together. She was gathering sticks, the Bible says. She, she built the fire and put, put the pan there. However they would fix that. And she made him a cake. And then she goes back and peeks down in the barrel and there's still meal in the barrel. She looks in the flask and there's still oil in the flask. You know what? She was sustained because if you will give God what he asked you to give, if you'll just use what you have, what doesn't seem like is enough will become enough. Somebody shout it is enough. She was another widow, 2 Kings chapter 4. And you'll find that her husband had died and had left a lot of debt. And the debtors had come to collect her sons to pay that debt. They was going to make them, he, the debtor was going to make her sons their servants because she had no money to pay the debt. They were going to have to work that debt off. And she began to grieve, telling the Lord, I don't want to lose my sons. I've already lost my husband. Some of you in the building today have made the statement, I can't lose anymore. And I do not know what to do. I don't have enough to pay my debt. I don't have enough to get out of the situation that I'm in. And you've come here today saying, what do I need to do? I'm going to tell you what you need to do. And he looked at this woman and he says, go to your neighbors and borrow of them empty vessels. Everybody say empty vessels. He didn't tell them what color it had to be. He didn't say how clean it had to be. He didn't say what shape it had to be. He said, just get some vessels that are empty. So they went door knocking. Brother Nehemiah, sound familiar? They went, they did a little outreach, if you will. Knocking on doors. Hello? Well, I'm so-and-so, son. I, my mom's come to ask me, do you have any spare vessels in the house? Do you have any empty vessels in the room? And, Oh, you know what? Yeah, we, we got some in the, in, the, in the back building out there. They've got spiders' webs and dirt and all over there. There's some of them got old stuff in them. Some of them might have been, even been spit tunes. I don't know. 
Uh, she didn't say how they'd been used. She just said, need some empty vessels, it'll do. And they began to gather from house to house. Some of them were different colors and some of them maybe had some paint on them and some of them had some markings on them and some of them had whatever, but they began to gather. And, and the prophet said, do not gather a few. The reason this came about is because when the prophet came to her house, he looked at the widow woman when she had prayed and God sent the man of God to her, and he said, what's going on? She said, I don't want to lose my sons. He says this to her, what do you have in your house? And you know what she said? Nothing. Look at your neighbor and say nothing. How many ever felt like you had nothing? Four of you. How many ever felt like you didn't have the resources to get you out of where you were? I know some of you are thinking about money right now, but some of you don't have enough joy, enough happiness. You, you can't seem to get out of the pit that you're in. You, you, you feel troubled and, and on every side. And you say, I don't know how I'm going to get out. I just don't feel like I have the strength. Some of you said, I don't even have the strength. Hey, lady, what do you have in your house? Sister Tabor, he said, what do you have in your house? And she said, Said, yeah, that's probably how she said it. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. But it's almost, it's, a, it's a, like a comma there. It, nothing. Well, save a little oil. It, it's just, a, I would consider it not enough. It's just a, a, a little bit of oil. He said, get your boys. You run to that door over there and knock on it. You run to that door over there and you knock on it. Go send those two boys out and go see if they've got any vessels. And uh, it doesn't make sense to have this much oil and to go get a whole bunch of vessels to take this much oil. It doesn't make any sense. But when God's in what he says, when God tells you to do something, what seems like is not enough will always become enough. Better knock on that door see if there's any vessels out there. You got to knock harder than that. They're stubborn. And they start knocking on the door. People opened up that door. People opened up that door. And can I, can I borrow some vessels? And, and so they did. And they come back with an arm full of vessels. Come on, bring, bring some vessels with you. And they come and started stacking them here at the, at the house. And Come on. Oh, oh, no, not too fast. Don't want to drop them. You got to increase your faith. You got to. They start stocking it. Hey, uh, I, I need a... Brother Mealy, Brother Mealy, do you, do you have your anointing oil on you? You do? Oh, my lance. What do you have? Nothing. Well, actually, just a little bit of oil. <laughs> I can see the preacher. Go gather all the vessels you can. Well, they didn't just make one trip. He said, gather not a few. Now go, go, go. You got to go to that door. You go to that door. Run, run. We got to get. I don't want to lose my boys. If you don't get vessels, you're going to become a slave. Or in the back, Denver, go back. You've already knocked on that door. You ever notice people get upset when you knock on the door more than ask them for the same thing? Knock. You better go to that door. You've already knocked on that door. We got to get some vessels. Go ahead. Go on back. Go on back. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I don't know if that's one or seven. I don't know. But he, he's bringing vessels in. And Come on. Bring some of those vessels back down. He said, gather not a few. Everybody say, gather not a few. What you've got to start learning is your faith leads to expectation. And what seemingly is not enough. Come on. Come on down. You don't drop the vessel off. Bring, bring them down. And they came and they filled the room up. And set the vessel. Don't drop it. Don't break it. It's made of clay. It's, a, it's an earthen vessel. Yeah, there you <laughs> They just knocked over seven, seven other vessels laying those down. Did y'all notice that? I remember where y'all set those down a while ago. And they gathered. Just keep, keep, keep going. And, and they're gathering not a few. What you've got to learn is that for her to be obedient, she must have been believing 
what the man of God had said. You see, if God gives you a word, it's because he's got an end in mind. If God gives a commandment, it's because it's laced with a promise. He said, go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. It made no sense. But he knew that as soon as he washes his eyes in the pool, what man can never do, God was getting ready to do. It's just a pool of water. It's just a pool of water. But it was enough. Hallelujah. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, Brother Nehemiah, what I feel. This is what we're going to do in Zanesville. We're going to go from house to house and say, can I pray with you? We just believe God wants to fill you up. We've got something. We believe God wants to do something in your family. In your life. Come on, do you believe that? Somebody say amen. I want you to shout, it is enough. Thing's so small, where did I leave that little bit of oil? It takes a little bit of, just a little bit. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not enough. But she starts pouring in. Where'd the boys go? You've been working hard. They, you can't take the vessels with you. Bring them here. That's right. Put them down. And they put them down. And the boys gather around the house. And the Bible says they shut the door. Brother Winnegar, shut the door on the house. Thank you. Shut the door. Shut the door. And they come in. And they watch mama start pouring in the oil. How many of you have ever seen those little baby dolls with the little milk thing in it? The more you pour, it just seems like it just stays full all the time. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I got two little girls at the house. They used to have those when I was little. And she's pouring, and that little, that little container fills up this vessel. It fills up that vessel. It filled up his. I was getting ready to say keg, but that's the wrong word for church. <laughs> Barrel of oil. Fills it up and goes to another one. And one of them about that big. Down here. Little kid size. Because it didn't say how big the vessel had to be. Or how small it had to be. She's got revival in her hand. She's got abundance in her hand. Some of you feel like you are about to lose it all, but what you do not realize, there's abundance in your hand. There's abundance in your mouth. There's abundance in your spirit. God's not done with your family. He's not done with your marriage. You're going to have more love than you've ever had because if you're just giving what you have... It is enough. Somebody shouted, it is enough. Somebody shout, hallelujah. It's enough. God wants to heal some of you here right now. Some of you feel like it's over. The enemy's coming. He's going to take what's left of my family. But I'm telling you right now, the under the unction of the Holy Ghost, that God's going to heal your family. He's going to remove them, the debt from your life, and he's going to sustain do you believe what I'm saying? I think you got to clap your hands and shout, It is enough. It is enough. It is enough. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. I come to preach to you if you only knew what was in your hand. Brother Chris Flinger, if you only realize what's in your hand today. Brother Nehemiah, Brother Redman, if you only knew what's in your hand. He said, whatever you do, lady, don't gather a few because he can see the potential of the abundance of God when all she could see was not enough. But when she obeyed from her heart what he could see, she began to see what the man of God could see. If you would be obedient to his word, he'll set your mind free, your emotions free. Well, well, Pastor Bounds, I'm at midlife crisis. I feel numb and I feel old. Let me tell you something. You're gonna feel strength 
and you're going to feel love like you've never felt before. But you've got to be willing to give God what's in your hand. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about a little faith right now. This is, I believe I'm coming out of this. Come on, anybody in the building believe what I'm preaching? I'm coming out of this. Something great's about to take place, and I receive you know what I believe? I feel like the prophet Elijah. The prophet Elijah, excuse me, that walked in this room and said, if you just give God what you have, he's going to do what no man can do. He's going to do what no doctor can do. He's going to do what no therapist can do. He's going to give you joy and peace. Somebody clap your hands and shout hallelujah. Gather, not a few. Brother Castle, gather, not a few. Gather, not a few. Because everything you bring in is going to be used and it's going to be filled. Somebody shout all of them. And they poured it in. And every was filled out of something she said was nothing. And that was not enough. Clap your hands and shout, it is enough. You may be seated. My dad tells me the story. I remember the story. He didn't only tell me, I remember. I was 12 years old. He told us, he said, God is gonna, has called me to build a great church in Glen Ferris, West Virginia. I was just a boy and we went to that little town. We sold the farm that we loved. Sold the house where we lived, and he bought an old schoolhouse. 100 years old, that schoolhouse was. It was eaten up by termites. River rats were in it. Old building, but he felt like God was going to do something there. He built an apartment in the back corner of the building. And I remember walking in there one day after church, opened up the refrigerator after we'd been in the church a little while, and the only thing in that refrigerator was a bottle of ketchup. You've never seen ketchup glow so bright until it was all by itself in a white refrigerator. I was 12 years old and I said to myself, what are we going to eat tonight? But this is what I did. I said, but dad said God was going to take care of us. So at 12 years old, I shut the door without saying anything to mom and dad or my brother. I said, I'm just going to see what God does. I was a boy, but we had a word. The man of God, my pastor, who was my father, spoke a word to our family that God was going to take care of us. Brother Garrett Redmond, I'll never forget it, that the phone rings a little bit later. Mom pulled some things out of the cupboards and fixed us a meal, but the phone rang, and a man by the name of Delton Smith from Parkersburg, West Virginia, he called, and he said, Brother Bounds, he said, I want you, I want you to come preach for me this weekend. He wrote my dad a check for 800 bucks that weekend. He said, take care of your family. He said, by the way, we've, the church wanted to give you a pounding. That doesn't mean beat up. That means food drive. I'll never forget, Brother John, that when I got into that car, they couldn't, they couldn't hardly even get the trunk closed. There were so many groceries in that trunk. When I got into my seat, there was a box of groceries sitting in my seat. I had to sit on a box of groceries and put my feet propped up on a box of groceries. My brother got in and had to sit on a box of groceries, put his feet up on a box of groceries. You know why? Because if God says, I'm going to take care of you, he's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. And I'm telling somebody in this room right now, he's going to take care of it. He's going to finish what he began. If you believe it, shout, yeah! Yeah! I'll be done in a few moments. Let's get into the New Testament. In Mark chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus is preaching. 5,000 men had followed him. And when the day was now far spent, spent, his disciples come to him and said, this is a desert place. Look at your neighbors say a desert place. And now the time is far spent. Send them or the multitude away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing. Everybody shout nothing. It appears to me that when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. Come on, look at your neighbor and say when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. 
I just feel that. Some of you in the room feel like you're down to nothing. But God's getting ready to turn it so far around. You're going to be able to say, it was only God that could have done this. So instead of walking out down, you need to walk out with your hands lifted and say, God is getting ready to fix this in my life. If you believe it, shout amen. Somebody could actually be healed right now in this room. If you just stand to your feet and say, I believe God's going to fix it. I am right now putting it in God's hands. Go ahead. All over the building. If you got the faith to believe, I want you to lift your hands and say, I know it doesn't look like much, but I'm turning it over to you. I'm turning it over to you. Come on, be healed in the name of Jesus. Let that situation turn in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. You don't need a whole lot. Just use what you got. I'll be done in just a moment. How many feel victory in the building? Her name was Anna Leitner. God spoke to me on a Sunday. Bishop Ferris was still pastoring. God spoke to me and before I could talk myself out of it, I said it. And I said last Sunday night, and that's where Hal was preaching when I was youth pastor. I don't know if I've changed much, I don't think. I said, next Sunday night, on Sunday night, there's going to be a healing service here at the anchor. And everybody that needs a healing is going to get healed. Ask your neighbors. Go to the neighbors. Ask everybody you know that's sick. Tell them to come to church. They will be healed. Boy, I said it so fast. When the anointing lifted from me, the Spirit of the Lord lifted from me, I thought, oh my, oh God, what did I say? Somebody's going to come in, and they're going to walk in the room, and they're not going to get healed, and they're going to say, you know, he, uh, he sure is green behind the ears. Wasn't that sweet of him to have that faith? Young preacher. Being bold with no wisdom. Zealous and no wisdom. Let me tell you what's worse than having zeal with no wisdom. is having wisdom with no zeal. It's having knowledge and no faith. Sounds pharisaical. No faith. And I got up and spoke that word, Brother Ron. And when I did, I felt it shift in my spirit. That next Thursday, my brother came and preached about some things he'd seen at a crusade. People got healed on Thursday night. When I was just in my own normal carnal mind, I thought, oh, I can't believe what I said. But when I would start praying to him, I knew it was right. And on Sunday night, there was a whole church full of people that needed healed. And Jay Southall went to his neighbor, Anna Leitner, Knocked on her door and he said, Anna, my pastor said that everybody that needs a healing is going to get healed. And I want you to come to church because what do you have to lose? They've only given you six months to live. The doctor said, give everything you're going to give away. Set your house in order because you're going to die within six months. Anna came in that night on that Sunday night. She probably didn't feel like she'd never been in a Pentecostal service. She'd never been in a, a spirit-filled church. When she came in, had a beanie hat on, she didn't have any air. And she sat right here in one of these seats, right, right in this area, one of these. And at the end of the message, I was talking about the lepers. I only preached about 15 minutes. And I said, the, all he said was to the lepers, go show yourself to the priest. It wasn't much, but it was enough. And I said, if you need a healing in your body, just step out of your seat and start walking. That's all I said. It doesn't look like much. But out of the obedience to the man of God and to the word that night, when she stepped out of her seat, she later told me, she said, I felt fire burn from the top of my head to my feet. She said, something come all over me. Went to the doctor the next week, and this was probably 13 years ago. And she went to the doctor, and the doctor said, Anna, I've examined your lungs. I've looked down in there where the, she said, there is no more cancer in your body. She's got long blonde hair today. 13 years later, you know why? Because what seemingly just stepping out of your seat doesn't seem like it's enough. When you do it in the name of the Lord, it is enough. Somebody shout, it is enough. Now here's what we do. I'm coming to a close. Here's what we do. Jesus is in the desert. He says to us, they say to Jesus, the people are hungry. They need something to eat. And uh, he said, we probably ought to dismiss church from the desert. 
so they can get back in town and buy them something to eat. And he answered and said unto them, you give them to eat. Well, that's a candy wrapper. I've already eaten that. Lord, I, I don't have anything. Well, go find something. That's what he told them. We know from another gospel that Andrew found a boy that had packed lunch. And all he had, can you imagine being Jesus and seeing what's about to happen? A little boy says, they're, they're out gathering food. Anybody have any food with you? Does anybody have anything? Five, surely somebody's got to have something. Finally finds a little boy with a lunchbox. I don't know if it's Scooby-Doo or not. But he had a lunchbox and he had five loaves. Five loaves and look at your neighbor and say, it's not enough. Five loaves wasn't loaves. It was about that big around, about as thick as your hand, five of them, like a slice of bread. And two fishes. Not even enough fish to put in between two slices of bread and make a sandwich. And they said, Lord, this is really all we have. It's enough. Set everybody down and in groups of 50s and 100s. Get everybody ready. Tell them to get ready to eat. We're getting ready to have dinner. <laughs> and he takes a piece of bread and a piece of fish and breaks it. He starts handing it to the 12 disciples. He divides it up. And they start breaking it. When they break it, somehow it's still in there. They break it up. And every time they go to break some, there's still more in their hand. I don't, can't explain it. But every time Jesus broke, there was still there not running out because when you believe if I would just give God what I have he will make it enough to sustain your need and some of you are walking around feeling unworthy well I'm not worthy to be here oh if God was really with me I would have more than what I have you need to quit thinking that way because the cross made you worthy to take what you do not have and make it great. He can take it and multiply it. And that's what God wants to do in this room right now. You don't feel like you got enough to get through? He's going to make it enough to get through. Come on, jump your feet and clap your hands and shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. I want everybody to shout, it is enough. And when they were done, there wasn't only everybody satisfied. But when a crowd had walked away, he said, don't let one fragment remain. Because what looks so minuscule to you and minimal to you is enough for him. And they gathered 12. You brethren, look at me. God can do more in 10 seconds. If they put the marriage in his hand, then I could do in 10 sessions of counseling. Because in his hand, it's more than enough. Some of you in this room are battling things in your mind that you can't seem to get beyond. But I'm telling you, if you obey his word today, he's going to heal your mind and give you clarity, soundness, peace, and joy. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Here's what I want you to do. Zerubbabel, I've got something with you that's beyond you. I'm letting you see something that nobody else could see. On each side of you, there's an olive tree with golden pipes that's running down toward you. You don't even know what it is, but I'm going to tell you what it is. These are the anointed ones that stand by the Lord continually. It's not by might. And it's not by power. And under the sound of my voice, there's a multitude of people in here that felt like you got started, but you're not able to finish. But he said, here's what I'm going to do. You're going to finish the temple that you started. And everybody's going to know that I'm with you. Because what seems too big for you, everybody's going to see the miracle that I'm going to work in your life. And they're going to know that it wasn't by your strength. And it wasn't by your power, but it was by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And some of you are standing at the foundation or the beginning that seems so small and minuscule to where you want to be. 
But the Lord said, if you will look on what I see, you're going to receive what I see. And that is the finished product of what has been started. Come on. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, but I will be with you until the... Did he not say in his last statement at the cross, it is finished because when it is enough it will be finished stretch your hands to the Lord and say I've been measuring some things that didn't seem enough but God now I see around me that I'm not alone hallelujah hallelujah in the name of Jesus there's victory in this room right now. And then I come and hold this plummet line. You didn't fail because God wasn't with you. You failed because you couldn't see him with you. And because you didn't feel like he was there, you went off and made decisions that were not right. But God has brought me here today to open up your eyes and say, it was never about how much you had anyhow. It's about being able to see him who is invisible. To know that if I give this to him today, he's going to fix what I cannot fix on my own. And I believe there is healing, there's miracle, and there's a breakthrough in this service. If you believe it, I want you to shout, Amen! Amen. You ready to give it to God? The loaves and fishes, everybody say, we're enough. Slingshot. Samson's jawbone, the plummet line, somebody shout, it's enough. The disciples started measuring and say, Lord, do we need to buy 200 pennies of bread to feed all these people? No, just see what you got here. And the Lord's brought me here on a Sunday morning to ask you, what do you have? What will you give him? Will you step out in faith? Because if you will give him what you have, he's going to do what you can't. And in this room, there's miracles in marriages. There's, a, there's, a, there's healing in mentalities. There's healing in emotions. There's healing in your mind. God wants to bring healing to this room right now. I want you to lift your hands all over the building and begin to pray. And say, it is enough. Come on, that's it. It is enough. Your faith is enough. You don't need to go on a fast. You need to believe. Because God's going to do what no man can do if you will believe. Come on, Jairus. God's about to heal your daughter. Don't be afraid. Just believe. It's enough. It's enough. You say, but preacher, I don't know what to do. I'm going to tell you, just give him what you have. Some of you struggle just to get here this morning because of all the stress. It's going to be this simple. He said, he said to the man with a withered hand, just stretch forth your hand. It will be made whole as the other. We heard that two Sundays ago. If you will step out of your seat and not worry about what anybody says as if this is the pool of Bethesda, by the time you get here, God's already going to start turning that situation around in your life. Come on. That's how, it's that simple. God is reasonable. Marriage, family, children, health, forgiveness. There it is. I want you to come expect, expecting. Don't gather a few. You come with expectation. He's going to fill it up. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. I want you to come with your hands lifted, lifting your voice. Because you're going to feel healing coming over your spirit. I feel it right now all over this room. There's healing coming over this room right now.
Come on, you can feel that coming over your spirit.